a personal identity, a, a recovery positive identity. If you bump into this person in a stra as a stranger in a supermarket, they will tell you their story. Are you with me? This person has no boundaries. They will talk about addiction and recovery in a heartbeat. And that may be about all they can talk about outside the drug culture, is, the, is that. <laughs> recovery neutral identity. It sort of, it means, here, if, we do a, if we do a community survey of Atlanta, and I, I, you pick up the telephone, I say, is there anyone in the household who was once addicted to alcohol or other drugs who today is in long-term recovery from that disease? Now, I've used some language, right? I've used addicted, recovery, disease. And I'll get a certain percentage of people who say, yes, we have someone in the household like that. Would, could I interview them for 10 minutes? Now, let's ask the question differently. Is there anyone in this household who once had a significant problem with alcohol or other drugs who today doesn't have that problem? What do you think happens to the affirmative yeses when we ask the question the second way compared to the first? Now, what's interesting is then in the, well, in the interview data, we can actually check which met DSM-4 criteria for abuse or dependence. We have a lot of people who met DSM-4 criteria for a substance use disorder who will not self-identify themselves as an addict in recovery. But in fact, what? If you look at the, the exact criteria, they met the disease criteria and they don't today. They are what? Recovery neutral. They do not identify with that language. Do we also have people who are in recovery and because of the social stigma attached to addiction, they are deeply ashamed of their recovery? Can I, can I, can I tell a story on myself? This is deep. This is deep. I mean, this stigma is some nasty stuff. One day, I, I collect recovery paraphernalia because I, I got an addiction recovery institute that's like an art, historical archives. So I get t-shirts and buttons and stuff from all over the place. And pe people give me extra. They said, this is for your archives. This one's for you, Bill. So I, I, I could wear t-shirts from now for the next 100 years and not run out of t-shirts from all these marches and stuff. So one day, I, my wife and I are finishing up doing something. And she says, hey, will you run to the store and do this for me? And I said, sure. And without thinking, let me tell you what I did. I pulled off my recovery t-shirt that was pressed and clean. No reason to take this shirt off to go to the grocery store and reached over and pulled on, pulled on this simple white t-shirt without thinking. Then I get, and, and I get about halfway out the door and I suddenly realize what I did. Man, I almost wanted to cry. I mean, here I am, like one of these super recovery guru type people, right? And, and in that second, what was my behavior telling me? Man, you're still ashamed, you know? You'll go out there and, and stand in front of all them people and speak at the marches, but you're still afraid to go to your grocery store with that addiction recovery identity blazing across your test. And that was like a moment of awakening for me of just how deep this shame we can internalize is around that stigma. Yeah, we got a lot of high-functioning people who are in recovery, but they ain't going to be part of our marches. You know why? Partially because of their high social status. They still remain deeply ashamed of their recovery status. Do we need to change that? We're going to talk later about how do we attract people to treatment. What do you think that kind of shame does in terms of treatment seeking? Well, we have people who will only get to us. I'll tell you a story. I'm in my, my treatment unit one day, and the doors bust open. Double doors bust open. And there's this like entourage, about nine people surrounding. I can't even see who's in the middle. There's this little, little woman in the middle, beautifully dressed. And they're escorting her in for admission to my addiction treatment unit. She's just been transferred from the second med surge floor because she's got advanced alcoholic pancreatitis and cirrhosis. And she needs alcoholism treatment. Now this is from one of our most prominent families in my community. And we treated her and she never took another drink again in her life. And seven months later died from, from advanced liver disease from her alcoholism. Tell me why this woman had to drink till near death before she could come walk through the doors of a treatment center. This is about stigma, my friends. The, the, given that social status, she had to virtually be near death before the doctors would not give the family the option of not getting her to treatment at that point. It's kind of a neat story, too, because her, she was in so much pain at the end, her family actually offered her alcohol 
and she, and she claimed, in her classic words were, she, she rarely smiled, she, but she smiled that moment and said, I'm going out sober. <laughs>